Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Fadden. Thank you so much for being with us today on This is the Day. And Father Reed, welcome back. Great to be back. What are we going to hear about in today's program? Well, we're going to have a chance to talk to Michelle Buckman, author of this book, Rachel's Contrition. It was on Amazon's bestseller list. And also my brother priest and our great friend Father Matt Williams is here today to tell us about the upcoming Eucharistic Congress for Young Adults and College Students, April 1st and 2nd, Jay. Kevin, what will we hear about in the news today? Jay, the Pope asked for prayers for the safety and security of civilians in Libya. We also talk about the theme of the recent Lenten retreat at the Vatican and a new church is dedicated by the Pope in Rome. All those stories head in the news. Jay? All that and much more right now on This is the Day. Jay Fadden, thank you so much for joining us today on This is a Day, and I think you picked a great program to watch. We've got some wonderful guests, and Father Reed is back, and Kevin Nelson is here, so it's just a great show. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's great to see Father Matt Williams here today. Yeah. You know, the Eucharistic Congress is coming up in Boston's North End, the 1st and 2nd of April for college students and young adults. It's always a great event. I think this is the 4th. It is. The 4th. And we've covered it, uh, all of them. We've had uh, Father... Matt has been on before talking about the Eucharistic Congress. And, of course, it's the source and summit of our life in Christ. And I know when you were a pastor in one of your favorite parishes, and they were all your favorites, so <laughs> let's make sure True we say that. But uh, Holy Ghost and Whitman, you had adoration. So I know for you, and especially as a priest, the Eucharist is so important. Yeah, and just recently I was at Holy Ghost in Whitman, and we celebrated the 10th anniversary of perpetual adoration. It was a tremendous moment for the parish, uh, for J Father Jason Makos, the pastor there now, and, and for me, because I had been there, uh, because of the great devotion that people have to the Lord's presence, His true presence in the Eucharist. And during this Eucharistic Congress in the North End, which is typical of Eucharistic Congresses, the Blessed Sacrament will be carried in procession throughout the streets of the North End, which is a wonderful witness to our faith in, in Jesus' real presence among us. So uh, we're looking forward to talking to Father Matt about that today. You know, I have... Um I, I have three children, as you as you well know, and I'm, one of them is a five-year-old, Ethan. And even with James, who will be 10 soon, and Amelia, who is 12, I always, after Mass, make sure that we walk up to where the uh, tabernacle is. Oh, good. So, and we kneel, we genuflect, so that they realize that the real presence of Christ is mm. in that tabernacle at all times, and that it's not just you receive the Eucharist and you're done, that there's mm. Jesus right there. Yeah. Very, very, very true. Well, it's an important thing. It is. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking this morning, too, weird as it might sound about Christmas, mm -hmm. uh, because during the Christmas season, and I know it's not even close to Christmas right now, in Piazza Navona, in the city of Rome, there is this enormous festival that goes on for weeks, and it's just a wonderful thing. If you've ever been to Rome, this is a place you have to visit. And we took a little Viaggio there, and it's a place called Piazza Navona. Take a look. Back in Rome, I'm Father E. Ciao, Amici. Here we are at Piazza Navona. This piazza is one of the most famous and arguably the most beautiful of Rome's many squares. The large and very lively space, even right now, features no less than three magnificent fountains. Another eye catcher is the Baroque church of San Agnese in Agone. You know, the shape of this piazza might just give you a clue as to its origins. Piazza Navona is built actually on the former Dormesian Stadium built by the Emperor Dormesian in 86 AD. Hence the long oval shape. The stadium, which had a larger area than the Colosseum, 
was mainly used for festivals and sporting events. The stadium was known as Circus Agonales, or the competition arena. In the 15th century, the stadium was paved over to create what we know today as Piazza Navona. The main artistic attraction of the piazza, as I mentioned, are the three fountains. The central and largest fountain is the Fontana dei Quattro Fiumi, the fountain of the four rivers. It was constructed between 1647 and 1651 at the request of Pope Innocent X. The design of the fountain was first commissioned to Borromini, but it was ultimately handed to our good friend Bernini. And there was a little tension there between the two men. The fountain features four figures representing a river from four different continents, the Nile, the Ganges, the Danube, and the Rio de la Planta. The statues at the base of the rock support, as you can see, an Egyptian obelisk. The two other fountains of the piazza are the Fontana de Nettuno, which is way down the other end, at the northern end of the, uh, of the piazza, and the Fontana del Moro, or the Moor Fountain, here at the southern end. The Fontana del Nettuno, Neptune's fountain, was built in 1576 by Giacomo della Porta. The statues, Neptune, surrounded by the sea nymphs, were added in the 19th century. Giacomo della Porta also built the Fontana del Moro. Here next to me, the central statue is a moor holding a dolphin designed by Bernini, and the, uh, the tritons were added in the 19th century. Now the highlight of the Navona Square is the Church of San Iese in Agone. It was commissioned by Pope Innocent X in 1652 and built on the site where it was believed that St. Agnes was stripped naked and then miraculously saved from disgrace by an extraordinary growth of her hair. The front facade of the Baroque church was designed by Borromini and he, of course, is Bernini's main rival. Construction started just two years after the completion of Bernini's Fontana dei Quattro Fiumi, right in the center of the square. The church was finished in 1670. Piazza Navona is situated in what's called the Centro Storico, the historic center of Rome, just west of the Pantheon. And as you can see, it is one of Rome's most alive open spaces, with a lot of outdoor cafes and great restaurants in the neighborhood and uh, also gelaterias, gelato by the way. Now that sounds like a really good thing to do right about now. So I'm gonna go find some gelato. For now everyone, ciao amici, ci vediamo presto. Piazza Navona, love the Piazza Navona. But you know what? I have to admit that I was doing during the, during that whole piece. What? I was looking in the background for my father, oh. who I know kept walking through and said, "Dad, get out, get out," and he'd keep walking into the frame. But I didn't see him. So, Jimmy. So I think we did. I think we did okay. Joining us now is Michelle Buckman, uh, author of Rachel's Contrition, which was on Amazon's best fiction seller fiction list. So thank you so much for being with us today, Michelle. How are you doing? Good. Nice to be here. Uh, it's we're so happy. Where, you, where are you skyping us from? South Carolina. Ah, I love South Carolina. Tell us about Rachel's contrition. Well, I first came up with a story when I heard a news story about a man who had found his child dead. I don't want to say where because I'd give away part of the story, but because of just hearing this really short news clip, I thought about the depth of what that meant to that family, that that man would have to go back and call his wife and tell them what had happened to their child and how it would disrupt their entire life and all the dreams they ever had. And it started me thinking about, excuse me, the story of their whole family beyond that point. And then I had a couple of friends that suffered through the same kind of loss. And so that inspired me to sit down and write the story. So it's a story of Rachel's grief as she's lost a child and her discovery of faith and renewal. In, in the, um, as the story progresses, she also stumbles into a teenager that's abused and a priest who has his own issues. And the three of them are just brought together by God in a very odd way. And they end up relying on each other to find renewal and hope. Michelle, this is Father Reed. Even though the novel isn't set in the Lenten season, certainly Rachel's story is the story of 
passion and resurrection. Can you tell us about her journey? Well, because she starts out um, wandering through this wasteland of grief. And because of that, it's kind of like Moses wandering through the desert. She just had no hope, no nowhere to turn and just feels totally lost. And so she goes through all that and she finally does get brought into the church by a teenager. And she starts discovering a faith that she never knew existed. And there's a point where she stumbles into a confessional and actually ends up making her first confession and finding the forgiveness of God and starts a new life from there. So it's like Lent going through all that and then fittingly it ends on Easter Sunday when she's brought her, herself through it all, mm. when God's brought her through it. Well, a Catholic novel on Amazon's best-selling fiction list. Congratulations. And what do you think of the, uh, what co contributes to the appeal of this book? Well, um, I think part of it is that it speaks to anyone who's a parent because everybody understands that immense loss that you can feel from losing a child. But it's also that it's wrapped around the Catholic faith and it has St. Therese woven all the way through it and her teachings to us of how to look for the little way and how to show our love to each other and how to understand that sometimes we can't feel God, but that God's presence is always there. He's always there to guide us and help us. And that really spoke to me as I was writing the story and it spoke to the character of Rachel because that's where she finds herself as if she's totally alone. Michelle, I see that a, a tattered holy card depicting St. Therese of Lisieux factors into the story too. You know, St. Therese is our patron saint here at the Catholic TV Network. Yes. Where can people learn more about the book and, and perhaps get a copy? Is there a website? Certainly they can go to my website, which is michellebuckman.com. And if they click on the book cover, they can actually read the first chapter of the book, and that will take them to the Institute Press's website, where they can order the book from there or on Amazon, and um, that, or they can call the Institute Press and, and order the book directly from there. Well, Michelle, thank you so much for being with us today and for writing such a great book. Always important to tell people about our faith in different ways, and I think you've achieved that. Well, thank you. I have, appreciate being on here. Have a great day now. Blessed Lynn. You thank too. you. Bye-bye, Michelle. Kevin, how are you doing over there? Good, Jay. Father, how are you doing? Well, we're doing pretty good. Can you tell us what's going on around the world in the Catholic faith? I certainly can. Thanks, Jay and Father. Hello, everyone. It is time to take a look at the news, and we begin from the Vatican. Pope Benedict XVI dedicated a new church in Rome on March 20th. The church called St. Corvinian is located on the southern edge of Rome and was financed with help from the Archdiocese of Munich and Freising, Germany, where Pope Benedict served as Archbishop in the late 1970s and early 1980s before being named Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Pope told the parishioners gathered that a parish church is a place for people to get to know God better, to worship Him together, and to learn how to take um, the message of His love to the neighborhood and the world. The Pope also told them that his papal coat of arms features the symbol most closely associated with St. Corbinian, a brown beer loaded with a pack on his back. Legend holds that the saint, a Frenchman who became the first bishop of Freising in the early 700s, was on his way to Rome when a bear attacked and killed his horse. And the saint punished the bear by making him carry the saint's belongings the rest of the way to Rome. In other news from the Vatican, speaking of pilgrims gathered in St. Peter's Square March 20th for the recitation of the Angelus, Pope Benedict XVI made an urgent appeal to political and military leaders to protect the safety and security of civilians and guarantee the free flow of humanitarian aid inside Libya. Rome Reports has more on the Pope's address. Benedict XVI has not hid his concern about the plight in Libya. He called on political leaders on both sides to ensure the safety of the Libyan people and access to humanitarian aid. Prego per coloro che sono coinvolti nella drammatica situazione di quel paese e rivolgo un pressante appello a quanti hanno responsabilità politiche e militari perché abbiano a cuore anzitutto l'incolumità e la sicurezza dei cittadini e garantiscano l'accesso ai soccorsi umanitari. The Pope said that he is closely following the situation in Libya and that he prayed for peace in that country during his week of retreat. Alla popolazione desidero assicurare la mia commossa vicinanza 
mentre chiede a Dio che un orizzonte di pace e di concordia sorga al più presto sulla Libia e sull'intera regione nordafricana. According to figures from the aid to the church in need, Christians in Libya represent only 2.7% of the population. The main religion is Sunni Islam. The United States, British and French military began a series of strikes against Libya's air defenses March 19th as part of a UN-approved effort to protect pro-democracy protesters from retaliation by Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. Bishop Giovanni Martinelli of Tripoli, Libya, criticized the rash and hasty decision to use military action against Gaddafi rather than pursue a negotiated solution. He told an Italian news agency that he hoped Gaddafi would surrender, but he thinks he will not give up. In fact, the bishop said he thinks military military force will only intensify the severity of Gaddafi's reaction. One other note from the Vatican, uh, Carmelite Father Francois-Marie Lathel, Secretary of the Pontifical Academy of Theology, led Pope Benedict XVI's recent Lenten retreat. Father Lathel said his 17 talks during the week focused on the saints and Pope John Paul II. In addition to helping Pope Benedict and Vatican officials prepare for Easter, Father Lethel says he wanted to help them prepare for the beatification on May 1st of Pope John Paul II. In his introduction to the retreat program, which was handed out to participants, including Pope Benedict and Vatican officials, Father Lethel wrote that Pope John Paul II's beatification, which will be an event of immense importance for the Church and the entire world, requires deep spiritual preparation involving, involving the entire people of God and in a particular way, the Holy Father and his closest collaborators. Father Lethel also focused on the importance of saints, not just as people to turn to when something is lost or a situation seems hopeless. He said they are examples to follow in prayer and in efforts to reform and renew the church. The tradition of having week-long preached spiritual exercises for the Pope and members of the papal household began with Pope Pius XI in 1925, but for more than 35 years it was an Advent, not a Lenten retreat. Pope John XXIII broke the Advent tradition in 1962 when he spent a week in September on retreat to prepare for the Second Vatican Council. His successor, Pope Paul VI, made the retreats a Lenten staple in 1964. And finally, in the news from around the country, in a statement on March 18th, Father Gerard Sheen, a spokesman for the Texas-based Society of Our Lady of the Most Holy Trinity, announced that Father John Carapi, a popular author and preacher, has been placed on administrative leave from priestly ministry over an accusation of misconduct. Father Sheen in the statement said it is important to keep in mind that this action is in no way applies that Father Carapi is guilty of the allegation. He went on to say that it is equally important to know that based on the information they have received thus far, the claim of misconduct does not involve minors and does not arise to the level of criminal conduct. Father Sheen said the matter would be investigated. In a statement on his website, Father Karapi said that all of the allegations in the complaint are false, and he asked for people to pray for all concerned. Well, that is all the information we have for you this Tuesday, March 22, 2011. We go back over to Father Reed and Jay with more of This is the Day. Well, joining us now is Father Matt Williams, and I have to tell you, you know why I'm, I'm thrilled? Not only because we're going to talk about the Eucharist Congress, but there's another reason I'm thrilled you're here. Tell me. Because now there are two Severian guys nice. sitting down <laughs> and one St. John's uh, prep guy. Are you St. John's prep? He's St. John's. You didn't know that? Congra I did not know that. Congratulations, your team just won the basketball state championship. Thanks. You're oh, very I didn't kind to that. say that. Yeah. And Kevin Nelson's Catholic Memorial. I did. I See, him didn't make it to share in the hockey uh, Finals, huh? Really? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Kev. What can he's, you do? He's not even talking That's over there. Well, listen. We, uh, and you actually filmed some of my football games. When I, I did. played high school football, you actually I filmed did. a couple of my games. Well, that was only a couple years Just ago. A couple so years. Let's, exactly. let's I had get a few that. grades to show Yeah, that let's, not, let's not tell everyone how long ago that was. I, and I remember you. <clears throat> I actually remember you. From those Fascinating. Times, yes, I do. I remember. I you. think I have the VHS tapes, to be honest did, with you. Those so. were great games. They were. Well, they were. <laughs> tell us about the upcoming <laughs> Eucharistic Congress. Great. Well, we're ha it's our fourth annual uh, Boston Eucharistic Congress for college students and young adults. And uh, last year, we fed over 400 college students and young adults this year. We're hoping we're going to feed a lot more and have uh, 
you know, we're, we're shooting for 600 for this year. So picture this, right? So you got a Saturday evening in the north. It's Friday and Saturday, but picture this, right, from the, the, the Golden Girls, right? Saturday evening, right, you, you have this wonderful mass with Cardinal Sean, followed by a dinner catered by the restaurants of the north. And I went begging for food on Friday. I spent all day Friday and the Friday before that, um, you know, knocking on the doors of restaurants and asking them if they would be willing to participate by donating and dish and stuff. And so many of the restaurants have been um, so generous in okay. donating dish. It's been wonderful. So, I mean, so you have this wonderful uh, layout of all these sumptuous Italian foods of the North End from the best of the best restaurants. They get to eat that. Then from there, we go to an evening session with John Niven in mm, the Lyft sure. Band. They, they'll yeah, do their, excellent. they'll pray, play their, uh, do some praise and worship about a half an hour. Then we have a speaker. Um, and one of the sisters for life will, will be will be with us, Sister a Karen. Great group. Yes, we're so we're so great blessed group. to have her. And then that evening, that night, we have the Eucharistic Congress. Again, like it, it's amazing when you think of uh, like literally, we shut down Hanover Street for about five to ten minutes so that we can cross the street. Four hundred of us following Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing. And and, and and during that experience, watching people come out of their restaurants, I'll never forget one of the years, watching this woman, ball crying as she's watching the, the procession go by, just so, so deeply moved, you know. And, and we have people that will go in and talk, do, do a little, little apologetics, explain, you know, you're, you're welcome to join us, come, come and walk with us and, and uh, help them to, you know, may understand this is Christ in the Eucharist and what we believe as Catholics, you know. That's the Saturday evening component. Certainly it begins on Friday evening with Father Roger Landry who kicks us off, followed by um, adoration and confession, and then the morning, Andreas Widmer, who will be oh, speaking. Sure. I know he's a friend of, of, of you guys. And, uh, and then a service project to kind of fill out that first half leading into the, the Mass of the Cardinal. Now, people, I know there are some young people who have gone for the last three years to the Eucharistic Congress. And when you talk about being fed, you're not just talking about food, you're talking about spiritual nourishment, and of course, uh, the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist that you receive together at Mass. But if there are some people who have come, are coming back, are there any new components? We have a new wrinkle, actually, really? this year. Oh. We do have a new wrinkle. We're very blessed. We, we have the John Paul II, or soon to be blessed John Paul II, vocation monstrance uh, that we'll be using for this entire weekend. And we're going to have all night adoration. So we're gonna. So there will be people in prayer during the entire Congress, praying and interceding like for it. it. So then, it's something you're, you're very, uh, very mm. familiar with, down at Holy Ghost from Whitman. So, so we'll have adoration all night long, into into um, from Friday evening all the way into to Saturday when we um, up until really Mass. So, uh, so that's one of the that's really the the newest wrinkle, if you will, other than this bringing the in speakers new speakers. New too, yeah. Breaking news. We have breaking news here now about that, huh? That's our breaking news. You know what I really enjoy about this though is here we have young adults and college students. And sometimes when you're in college especially, and, and I know this from experience, you, you can get lost a little bit yeah. because so much is going on and there's so many distractions and, and you start to say, well, how does my faith fit into this? Yeah. And here we have an event with the most important thing to watch, which is the Eucharist. And these young people can come together and know, hey, you know what? I'm not alone. That's wondering right. about my faith and how it fits in and, and I can still be, this can be an important part of my life and a fabric of my life just like it is with this four to six hundred other people. Yeah. It must be a great experience it, these young people. It is and you know um, we really try to, it, it, there's something for everyone and when, when I say that I mean the, for, you know, the, you, as I mentioned John Niven and you get the contemporary music but then you also have you know, um, uh, one of the schools, Magdalen College, will be coming, and their choir, and the much more traditional sound. You know, and there'll be Taze on Friday evening. So there's different types of of prayer and different types uh -huh. of of uh, forms of worship that appeal to everyone. You know, and also we have a significant service component. I I, I don't mean to uh, didn't mean to to leave that out either. Um, you know, we're 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 prepared to send out 400 college students, young adults, to serve. You know, from from the local, you know, helping out the local um, North End and whatever the needs are there, to going to to nursing homes, uh, hospitals, and uh, different things like that. So there's lots of opportunities for service. So, as you were saying, like you know, for young adults who are, who are finding their way, um, it becomes an opportunity. It, there's a lot of things to draw them. You know what I mean? Or different different tastes and, and different um, desires or, or, or interests. Um, all leading to the Eucharist, you know, mm. and I think that was the vision from the beginning, mm. you know, when Dan Hennessy, God bless him, Father Dan Hennessy, <clears throat> his vision for this was to unite uh, Eucharist and service and to show that, you know, service is not something that's just off on its own, but that it flows from the Eucharist and leads back sure. to the Eucharist. What do you think would surprise people at home? For instance, let's say 
I, I'm not a young adult anymore. I know that surprises really? you. Yeah, I know, I know. It's a big surprise to he everybody. He could pass as one, though. He I could, know, he... especially to our viewers with Father Reader tells everyone I'm old every single week. But what would surprise me if I went down and, let's say, attended some of this? What would surprise me about the young people who were there? Well, I would say that you, that you have, uh, what would surprise you is that these are normal, yeah. healthy young adults who love Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. who love their faith and, and their joyful witnesses. You know, I think you'd be amazed to see that the, the, the pockets of faith in the different college campus ministry programs and the different young adult communities, that, that is pretty strong. You know, they might not be overwhelming in number, but the quality of these young adults in their deep faith yeah. is, is inspiring. And, and the hope is, is that they, they would be further inspired to continue to be, be witnesses of Christ, but also that we would be able to invite other young adults who might still be trying to, you know, those college years or even young adult years where you're still trying to, you know, uh, you're still searching your faith, still mm -hmm. questioning, you're still trying to, you know, or you, you had that growing up and maybe you've fallen away for a little bit. Great opportunity to kind of begin again, especially with this, in light of this evangelization effort by the Archdiocese as well. With Catholics Come yeah. Home, we've been trying to connect that as well. Yeah. And Lent is a time for all of us to begin Amen. again. So maybe you could just extend an invitation now to, to anybody that's watching or they might know some young adult or college student and let them know where they can get the tickets and find out more information. Absolutely. would love that. What do I look? Do I look here? Do I look there? You no, can, look, look, there. You can right. look right there. So, all right. Well, uh, please, we, are, we would love, we have registrations at eucharisticcongress.com. Again, eucharisticcongress.com. We are happy in, uh, to, for all young adults and college students, especially I think like parents and grandparents, um, to get that word out to your, your children or grandchildren about this great opportunity. There's going to be lots of wonderful opportunities to pray, to serve God, and to feast uh, wonderful Italian food. So oh. please get that word out. Eucharisticcongress.org. Yes. Hey, and we'd be remiss if we did not say that people might have heard that voice before, too. Wednesday afternoons, oh, 4 to 5, The Good Catholic Life with Scott Landry, and you are a, a host on Wednesdays afternoons. That must be great. Yes, I'm one of, one of the, the co-hosts on, on Wednesday afternoons, so it's a, a new, new venture, but I'm excited because, you know, what faith comes by hearing. And you and know, so. WQOM, you can hear it in this area, but you can also listen to it at their website, uh, WQOM. Uh, their website, if you look it up, you can listen to it online, and so you can hear the, the message. And it's also available as a, as a podcast. Right? Yes, yeah. and, then, uh, and then the website for the, Ca the Good Catholic Life. So if you go to thegoodcatholiclife.com, you can follow the shows there as well. Yep, very good. A lot going on in the Archdiocese. Yeah. A lot of good, good stuff. stuff. Hey, keep up the great work. Always a pleasure to have you. Thank Thanks, you. Matt. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for joining us today on This is the Day. We hope you've been enjoyed the program. We certainly have. And... Our hope is that you will continue with your affirmation and support of Catholic TV or whatever Catholic station you're watching because it does make a difference. And we can just see, as Father Matt was saying, young people today so invested in the church and evangelizing out there. Know that all of you are in our thoughts and in our prayers. And in the midst of our Lenten journey, we ask God to continue to bless you with a deep awareness of His presence in your life and a spirit of conversion. And may Almighty God bless and protect you always, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining Jay and Kevin and Father Matt and Michelle and all of us here in the Catholic TV living room. We love coming into yours. Until next time, everyone. God bless. Have a great day.